Oh my goodness. What the heck? This is mad. That is so dodgy. That doesn't really make sense. The plot thickens. This electrical fault nearly killed me. And I'm back here today to try and find out what happened. Welcome to Artisan After Dark. So here's the backstory. Customer asked me to move a socket. Easy job, right? Move the socket from one side of the cupboard to the other side. They got a new dishwasher here. I said, no problem. Turn the power off, but I made a fatal mistake. I only tested line to neutral. Power was off. I thought everything was fine. Cracked on, started changing the socket, and then I got a massive electric shock. One of the worst electric shocks I've had in a while. But why? The circuit was turned off. Let me explain. So it's now a few days later and I'm back here to try and figure out exactly what is going on with this fault because I've still not got to the bottom of it. I left, I put the socket on, I tested everything, RCD test, earth loop impedance test. In fact, I'll show you. Uh, and the circuit all tests out fine, right? I'll try and simulate the fault for you again and we'll try and figure out what the heck is going on because it just, it blew my mind. Like, I just, I don't understand what's happening. Um, and I'd love you guys to let me know in the comments if you do know or you've had something like this before because I've been an electrician for like 20 years and I've still, I still don't know <laughs> what is going on. I've never had this kind of fault before. So let me show you. So we plug into this socket, right? It's all livened up. We've got 230 volts line to earth, nothing neutral to earth and 230 volts line to neutral. Seems perfect, right? The consumer unit is an all RCD consumer unit, all RCBOs. So every single circuit is protected by an RCBO. And if I do line to earth, earth loop impedance test, we've got 0 0.34 ohms, which is a very good earth loop impedance test reading. Now I'll do an RCBO test. I'm gonna press test, check to make sure the RCBO's working safely and tripping properly. That is all absolutely fine. So as an electrician, I've done all my tests that are required. I'm thinking, great, everything's safe. It all trips out properly. I'm safe to leave the installation. But the question is still there in my mind. Why was there power between line and earth and neutral and earth when I had the circuit turned off? Has that now been solved or is it still an issue? So let's check. So I'm gonna put it back on the voltage setting and I'm gonna turn the circuit breaker off for this particular circuit. Off. And this is where we get our issue. So we've got 170 volts between line and earth, 170 between neutral and earth now, and zero between line and neutral. And this is where I made a mistake. When you do safe isolation, you should always check between all the possible combinations, line to neutral, line to earth, neutral to earth. I didn't. I made the stupid mistake, which probably a lot of people have made in the past, of thinking that if there's no power line to neutral, everything would be fine, and that's why I got a belt. Luckily, I'm still alive to tell the tale, and there is still a fault that we need to fix. But lesson for you guys, always do a full safe isolation procedure because that could have killed me actually and I might not be here making this video today. What we're going to do now is try and figure out why the heck when we turn this circuit off is there still power coming onto the circuit somehow and why is it not tripping any breakers elsewhere because surely if there's a link between circuits or something like that it would be tripping something out somewhere else. Let's investigate. So my first thought with this is there must be some kind of interconnection between two circuits, maybe two socket circuits or something like that. So I thought, let me turn off another circuit, like the upstairs sockets, because potentially maybe when I changed the board, which I did not that long ago, maybe I wired the legs of the ring the wrong way around. So I'm gonna get the board cover off. I'm gonna test between the upstairs sockets breaker and the downstairs sockets breaker and see if there's any continuity between the two rings. I'm gonna do a full set of tests just to make sure that I'm not going completely insane and you know, maybe I've just made some kind of silly mistake when I changed the board. Let's check if there's any voltage between the breakers, okay. So between the neutrals on the upstairs sockets 
and the downstairs sockets there is two is 170 volts which is like what we had at the socket and if i test between the live and the live we've got 129 volts between the live of the upstairs sockets and the live of the downstairs sockets. If I test between live of the outgoing side of the downstairs sockets breaker, we've got 170 volts between live and CPC, or line and CPC, earth, and then we've got the same between neutral and earth. So if I pull these out, they're actually gonna be live, which I don't wanna do, that could be seriously dangerous. So what I'm thinking is maybe there is some kind of weird link between these circuits. And if I turn this one off, hopefully that will get rid of the voltage. Let's have a go. So I'll turn the upstairs socket circuit off. Yeah, there we go. That's got rid of that voltage. So there's definitely something weird going on between these two circuits. So I'm gonna do ring continuity on both, and then I'm gonna test between them, see if there's any kind of weird link going on. So first we'll do ring continuity on the neutrals. And this is basically just checking that there is a continuous ring circuit around both legs. In the UK, for those of you who are not from this country, we have these weird things called ring circuits where you've got two conductors going all the way round from one side to the other. So that is the kind of reading we want to see, 0.32. There is a continuous link around. Basically this goes from one socket to another socket to another socket all the way back to the consumer unit. So we should have the same on the lives and yeah, 0.33. That's as close as you would expect, which is good. Now we'll test the CPCs, circuit protective conductors, for those of you who don't know what that jargon is. I'm gonna pop those out and there should be a ring on these as well and we'd expect it to be a bit higher because it's a slightly larger conductor. Okay, 0.32, so it's pretty much the same. We'll do exactly the same with these. Make sure we've got a proper ring. So between neutral and neutral, Okay, we've got a ring, it's slightly smaller. So 0.21, this is the upstairs circuit. So obviously there's less points on it because it's just bedrooms. 0.24 on the lines, that's fine. Let's check the CPCs on this one as well. 0.57, so that's absolutely fine. So this is as we would expect. Now, what we can do is we can do a continuity test now between one ring and the other ring and see if there's anything. So there's no continuity between live of one ring and live of the other ring. Let's check on the neutrals, no continuity. Check on the CPCs. There is, but that could well be going through like bonding connections, like the pipe work for the boiler and stuff like that. So I'm not particularly worried about there being continuity between the CPCs. So that's weird. Now let's do an insulation resistance test then between these two, just ramp it up a level. If we do insulation resistance test, that should see whether there is any kind of interconnections. Okay, so we've got 0.14, so it's pretty, that's pretty high to be honest. If there was an interconnection between the circuits that was big enough to cause 170 volts, I would expect that reading to be higher. Let's check between the neutrals. 0.13 mega ohms. I mean, a mega ohm is a million ohms. So it's like 130,000 ohms. I mean, that is a lot of resistance still between these circuits. So there is basically no interlink between the two circuits, but that doesn't really make sense because how on earth is it that when we turn this one off, the power that's leaking through to this one somehow disappears? That's what makes no sense. The plot thickens. Maybe there's an appliance connected to the circuit which is leaking some kind of voltage onto the system. For example, some appliances like washing machines have capacitors in them and those capacitors hold a voltage and if they've got a faulty capacitor, the capacitor could actually leak that voltage down to earth and could put a voltage onto the circuit even when the breaker is switched off. I think what I'm gonna do is just go around and unplug all the appliances one by one and see if the voltage disappears when I unplug one of the appliances. So I'm gonna flick these two breakers back on now and we'll see if the fault reappears. <laughs> okay, so power's back on now and we've got line to earth, neutral to earth, voltage, line to neutral voltage, all good. So we'll try and re-simulate the fault again. We'll turn this circuit off again. So it's that one. Oh, and we should see uh, 
Yeah, so line to neutral, basically nothing. Line to earth, 170 volts. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna run around the kitchen and unplug everything that I think could be suspect, starting with this washing machine. <laughs> unplug that. Okay, wow, the voltage has actually gone up to 180, that's interesting. Uh, let's try this, we can take the fridge off. Okay, it's just going up every time I unplug stuff, that's really weird. Coffee machine, nothing. I mean, these are all switched off anyway, so it probably doesn't do anything, but we'll just go around and unplug. Wow, that's gone up even more. That's really weird how whenever you unplug something, it goes up. Let's try this one. 190 volts now. So this is a tumble dryer. I'm guessing it's plugged in in here. Okay, so unplug that. Oh, still 190 volts. Okay, let's try this. Let's try the boiler. Ah, bingo. Okay. The boiler. That is so weird. So what is going on that when we unplug the boiler, the fault disappears? Let's plug it back in and see. Oh my goodness, look at that. Yeah, that's appeared again. So there's something weird going on with the boiler. Maybe they've wired the boiler off two different circuits. That could be it. Right. In theory then, if I plug this into the socket there, it should do exactly the same thing. So if I move the tester, we should see exactly the same thing. Yeah, look, 190 volts. So that to me indicates, and this is mad, that this plug is feeding power back into the circuit, which means that these pins are actually live. But there's only one way to check that. In theory, if I test now this, we should have power on these pins. Let's have a look. Oh, oh my goodness, that is so dodgy. So we've got line to CPC, or live to earth pin basically, 217 volts. And then if we do the same to the neutral, 219 volts. And then if we do neutral to live, zero. What the heck is going on? Like why on earth would that be doing that? That just makes no sense at all. Why would there be no power between live and neutral, but there is between live and earth and neutral to earth? That is so crazy. But that is so dangerous. So this is live, right? I could, if I lick that, I'd be a goner. But imagine this situation, this fault might have been here for years. The customer could have unplugged this plug to plug something else in. That is exposed. Anyone could touch that. And if you touch that, you get an electric shock. So I've just gone back to the customer and said, look, is there any history there with the boiler? And the customer said, well, we had the boiler changed a while ago and there was something weird with the wiring of it. There was a cable feeding the old boiler, which is this twin and earth cable here. This cable is what used to feed the old boiler, but because the new boiler needed a permanent life, the plumber or electrician or whatever who wired it up had to wire it off a plug and plug it into the socket. So what I think has happened is the old boiler with the thermostat and everything was wired off the upstairs socket circuit and then in order to get a permanent live, because this twin and earth here only comes live when the central heating programmer is calling for heat, they've actually had to wire off a plug of this circuit, which means that the boiler is actually wired from two different circuits. And that is the weird interconnection thing. This is sort of hurting my head to, fig to go through this, but that would then explain why when I turn everything off, there's no links between the two circuits because when the system's calling for heat, it's a normally open contact that goes closed. But that goes closed by electricity because the system's calling for heat. When there's no power to the system, that will open again and then there's no interconnection between the two systems. Am I making sense? This is mental, guys. I've never had a fault like this before where so many different things need to happen in order for the fault to actually have appeared. When I was here and the customer asked me, oh, while you're here, can you just change that socket? If I'd have said, no, sorry, I'm too busy, would have never found the fault. If the heating system was off, 
I would have never found the fault because it wouldn't have manifested itself. I think we're going to need to dig a little bit deeper into the way that they've wired the heating system and to do that we probably need to go upstairs. Right, so the central heating stuff is in here. So this is the twin and earth that goes down to the boiler. The customer said, interestingly, that when the person did fit the boiler, the plumber came out and he was like, oh, the wiring's a bit weird and needs an electrician. The electrician came out, opened the cover of the boiler and everything went bang because there was a live wire just hanging in the back of the boiler that the plumber had left for him. It was a secret trap because plumbers love trying to kill electricians. You should never have one piece of equipment fed from two different circuits, that is just so dangerous. The only way that I can think to solve this, but I need to check in the boiler first, but I think, okay, the boiler needs permanent power, so we need to get a permanent live over to there from here so that it's all on the same circuit. That means that we're gonna really need to replace this with a three core on earth, having one core as permanent live, second core as switch live, third core as neutral, and then the CPC. But the problem is, <laughs> it's not going to be easy to get a new cable in because there, behind you, I'll show you, is the bathroom. So we've got a lino floor and this right here is where the boiler is, below the bath, below a lino floor. Probably the worst possible place that it could be. So how are we going to get a cable from there to there? It's nearly seven o'clock and I can't really leave until this is fixed. There's this which goes in here and I'm thinking, could we just pull in a new cable on it? But I mean, it's bound to be going through various joists and holes and joists and things. I think it's gonna be almost impossible. Now all the plumbers are shouting at me. You're not allowed to take the cover off a boiler. That's a heating engineer's job. I'll tell you what, what the way they've wired this up. Oh my goodness, look at that. Wow, okay. That, oh, the plot thickens, right, okay. This kind of makes a lot of sense now. So they've only wired the switch live off the heating circuit. So only the switch live, the neutral and the earth are not connected at all. The neutral and earth for the boiler are actually coming off this plug. So you've got permanent live neutral and earth coming off the downstairs socket circuit and then switch live coming off the upstairs socket circuit. What a bodge. Really what we need is permanent live, switch live, neutral and earth all coming off that upstairs heating spur so that there's one point of isolation for everything and everything's off the same circuit. So how the heck are we gonna get cable to here guys? That is the question. There's just no way that we're gonna be able to pull in a new cable on this old one. We're not getting any floorboards up or anything like that. So my other option is to look downwards and go, okay, we've got worktop units. We've got a hole here where we could potentially fish like a boxing and we could potentially get behind these kitchen units. So that kind of takes us along and this is where our consumer unit is. And then up above here, because this is the old thermostat cable, which has got green goo in it, by the way, just as a nice side note. Here, we're pretty much below that cupboard up above. So I'm thinking if we can get somehow up into that cupboard from here, then we can pop through the wall. We can probably get the cable down. That part, uh, I reckon we can definitely do. This is the part that I'm not sure about. So this is the part that I'm gonna have to investigate now. So where I am now, obviously that's the cupboard under the stairs. Over there, about a metre this way, is where that cable goes down. So we're definitely gonna have to try and get some kind of floorboards up. So I'm just gonna pop the carpet up here. <laughs> if I can get the corner up, usually, once you get a corner up then, you're all right. Let me know guys if you've got any tips for getting carpets up. There we go. Right. Okay, there's a floorboard that's been cut there. <laughs> oh, this is where my career as an electrician ends. These boards, they've had them up at some point, but before they laid the carpet, so like this one's been up, but it's going underneath there, so I'm gonna have to get that carpet gripper up. It's just a flipping nightmare. Oh, here we go. Ah, uh, it's looking better, okay. This one. This one has got lots of space under it. Okay, we've got a join, that's good. Oh no, don't look. 
There's lots of dodgy junction boxes on the floor. So then you have to use the John technique. So the bricks here, I believe are the entrance into the kitchen. So that's like, that is where the kitchen door is. This is getting worse and worse guys. So the stairs are not exactly straightforward either because half of the stairs are in the kitchen and half the stairs are in the, uh, the, the living room. So this is the wall through to the kitchen, right? And therefore like this part of the stairs is actually coming up through the kitchen. This part is going through the, the living room. So what I'm thinking is if I can angle drill down here at an angle and come out in the understairs cupboard, that might work. <sighs> Even for me, that is a long shot. So I'm a little bit scared. Finally get to use the new Hilti for artisan angle drilling. I'm very pleased. What I'm gonna do is go in that corner there and I'm just gonna do it by eye. Um, and we want to basically come out in the top corner of the cupboard. How are we looking with that angle? It's... Okay, we've not come out in the stairs yet, that's good. Okay, I think the drill bit has come out. Where it's come out, we have no idea yet. Let's see. Oh, oh, this is exciting and scary. Oh yes, you beauty, look at that. Go in, go in, look at that. You flippin' beauty. That okay. is why they call it artisan angle drilling. That is amazing. Oh, let's open it up, six mil more. It's not gonna hurt and it's gonna avoid us from actually getting stuck with the cable when we try and pull it through. I'll line that up, just get the new drill at the same angle and we drill in our new hole. It's not gonna go at a different angle. So where that cable came through is perfect because, let me show you. That is where the hole is, up in that corner there and we can literally clip the cable along that wood there, probably underneath, and then down that wood there in the corner and then and down here, past the shoes, down, 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 to here, where we have this trunking, where they've run in a new oven circuit and a spur for an extra socket. And that goes through the wall into the back of the kitchen cupboards there. There we go. Hopefully, wow, there's a whole botchery of cables under here, look at that. Got some nice junction boxes under there. But yeah, we've got a clear run under here. Oh, there's a couple of bricks. What the heck? Looks like there's a couple of bricks holding your oven up. We can see that trunking. So that trunking ends there where those cables pop out. We can just continue, just run our cable along the back of there, along, 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 behind this appliance here. So we have to pull that out and then up through that boxing into our boiler. Ta -da! So that is our angle drilling hole right there. Shove the cable down and hopefully it will just pop out in the room below. So we should find a he. One lovely three core and earth cable. That should be long enough to go to our boiler. Hey hey! We have cable. Absolutely fantastic. Oh, 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 oh. oh yes, that makes it all worthwhile. So I'm gonna just clip this up along the skirting a little bit. And then I think what we're gonna have to do is put a, a Vargo box here just to kind of terminate that flex into. All we gotta do now is get it into the cupboard. Should be the easy part. Through these two holes in the joists, and then we should be able to fish it up with these. I do love this Wee Heart electrician's hammer. It's just such a great hammer, this. It's just the perfect weight 
the perfect size, perfect balance. That's tool of the day, link in the description. This is where you've got to be really careful, right, when you're hammering uh, floorboards back. You can easily get them mixed up, right, and they'll fit. You might have a problem if you try and hammer them back down, and this is a classic example. I could put that one there, but then look what's going to happen if I nail that down straight through a pipe, because actually that one is supposed to go there. The dangerous plug is no more. So this is basically our permanent live. That's going to go in there. This is our neutral. That's going to go in there. This is our CPC, which is going to go in there. And then switch live. It's going to come off this. So I'm going to pop another CPC in there. I'll just ferrule this one up. Those will then all tuck neatly into bed in there. Sweet as a nut. The joy now, we can get rid of this horrible bodge cable. Cut that bit of nastiness off. So the circuit's back live, heating's working, hot water's working, all good. But the big question is, have we completely got rid of the fault now? Let's try, so I'm gonna do exactly the same as what I did before. Turn the circuit off, see what happens. So before, when I turned the circuit off, we had 180 odd volts live to, to earth. Now, we've got nothing. Fault is gone. My brain is also gone. So, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you like and subscribe. And we'll see you on another epic fault finding video one day soon. If you'd like to watch more, there'll be another couple of videos popping up after this. Why not grab a cup of tea and watch a few more? But either way, thanks for watching and have a great evening. Is it time to go home yet? Guys. <laughs> <laughs>